I know we want to make the most of this hour and we're all anxious to hear the download from Zephra and get to any uh, discussion we have time for. So I'll, uh, I'll throw it over to, to, to Peggy to um, introduce the okay. network and our speaker. Okay, so today we are here as a result of a collaboration between the Western Mass Pollinator Networks and Mass, the Massachusetts chapter of NOFA. And we are collaborating because we need to go statewide. And so much has been happening in the last uh, couple of years. Other people are getting interested all over the state and beyond Massachusetts. And now we're on a fundraiser to raise money to make that um, uh, our pollinator support go across the state with a coordinator. And so, uh, as Marty said, we're hoping that you're inspired to give something to help us get to our goal. Um, tonight, uh, we're gonna have Sephra Alexander present. And I was fortunate to hear Sephra uh, in January at the Northeast Organic Seed Conference, which was part of the um, annual conference by the New York chapter of NOFRA. And just the title, the Ecotype Project and Ecological Seed Restoration seem really fascinating to me. So I signed right up as soon as I heard about it. So Sephra is uh, leading the Connecticut NOFA chapter of Pollinator Health Initiative and within that, the ecotype project that she's gonna tell us about. She holds her ma teaching masters in agroecological education. None of these subjects were around when I went to college, but thank goodness they're around now. And she graduated from Cornell. She's trained in the tradition of seed saving by the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance. And I might say, this is something that's really, really important as we read articles about biodiversity shrinking around the planet. Her other title is the Seed Huntress, to me a quite intriguing title, and again, much needed in this time of threatened biodiversity. So Seed Huntress, take it away. And as you have questions, you might put them in the chat and we'll be taking questions towards uh, at the end of her talk. Well, thanks Peggy and Marty and everyone at NOFA Mass and in um, your new network. It is such a pleasure to see all the enthusiasm and all of the organizations joining together around pollinator health. That is what it's all about. And um, I'm honored to be here and talking to you all tonight. I do acknowledge that I'm talking to you from Connecticut, which is an Algonquin word that means the long tidal river. And we will be talking about riparian corridors and the Northeast specifically. But before we go into that, I wanted to give you a brief overview of what seed conservation and seed banking in its different iterations looks like on an international and national scale. So first off, as was mentioned, um, I go by the seed huntress, which I respectfully use as a way, I, sometimes I think ethnobotany and botany needs a little marketing these days to get people excited about it. So um, it's really just a respectful term that I use in an effort to um, hunt for different ways around the world to help conserve these wild native indigenous local ecotypic seeds where they exist and help the people that are there to caretake and steward them. So um, I was grateful when Forbes featured it, it shows that this, uh, the importance of preserving biodiversity on a global scale is becoming a more um, acceptable, approachable and talked about theme amongst the Vox Populi, amongst people around the world. And um, it was really a privilege to um, be chosen as a fellow for the crop trust. So the crop trust, um, perhaps some of you have heard about the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. Um, some people call it the Doomsday Vault and so forth. But what it is, is it's up in Longyearbyen, farthest north you can get, or, or there's an airport too. Um, and there's this vault there, which each of, uh, I think is a hundred and I, I don't know what the exact number is at, but um, 123 countries have submitted their seeds to be safeguarded in this vault. So in terms of man-made or natural disasters, if they ever needed to reaccess those genetics, 
which have been adapting to wherever they're from since time immemorial. Um, whether it's hot, dry, cool, cold, you can think of all the different variations of terroir or soil conditions around the world. And it's imperative to save these genetics in those types of situations. For example, Syria, um, their seed bank was bombed. And if it had, they didn't have a backup here in Svalbard, so many of those ancient grains and those, those beautiful crops that they have over there would have been lost. And um, so I was chosen as a fellow to go uh, do field work and explain the importance of these seed banks. Now, when you have seeds stored like this away from where they are located in their soil, that's called ex situ, E-X-S-I-T-U, two words, um, conservation. And as you can see here, the way it's decided where those seed banks around the world is based on something called centers of origin. Now, Nikolai Vavilov was um, in the uh, early 1900s was going on botanical expeditions around, around the world and saying, we need to start safeguarding these seeds because they're super important for um, breeding projects and also for making sure that we don't lose these magnificent arcs of diversity that exist around the world. And what he observed was where these crop wild relatives, um, the teosinte for corn, for example, or the tepary bean, where they first emerge is where these crops, sorry, that's my dog shaking my computer, um, is where they express their greatest amounts of diversity. So you have your corn and wheat in Mexico, you have your pulses and grains um, in India, your potatoes in Peru, and you can start to see the world map as where these cultivated crops uh, now grow and then are saved. So um, this is a quick map of where those seed banks exist around the world. You have this, the, the seed bank for agroforestry trees in Kenya. And I went to CPACT, which is the Center for Pacific Crops and Trees in Fiji. And so I did my field work all around the South Pacific studying taro. Now, Colocasia esculenta is a staple food crop that has that, that big um, tuber-like uh, rhizome, which is basically uh, a staple food crop for must, much of the subsistence farming nations. The entire plant is edible. It's a totem crop, ethnobotanically speaking, because it's so important to their culture. It's given in rituals of birth and um, marriage and death and so forth. In 1993, a blight came in and wiped everything out. Um, and that completely altered their export, their, 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 which is their main export. So their economy, their culture, and their main food source for food security. So my work was showing the breeding efforts that were done to rebreed a blight resistant taro and why having that safeguarded in a seed bank was so important. Um, sorry to go back and forth on slides, but if you see those little vials up in the right-hand corner, those are those taro in vitro. Because oftentimes when we think of seed banking seeds, like the ones down below, those are orthodox seeds, like your tomatoes and your peppers, the seeds that you can fully desiccate or dry out and they can maintain their viability. But a lot of the tropical plants are recalcitrant, which means you have to keep vegetative propagules or these little plantlets um, in a growing medium to maintain their viability. And so that's how you can maintain those genetics. So that was a wonderful project. Um, my brother and I um, from a natural disaster perspective have responded to a whole bunch of um, island nations after disasters and helped fortify their community seed banks. Now a community seed bank is a backup of your bioregionally adapted seed. Let's say this was in Haiti. And when a storm wipes out all your fields, there's no seed bank or seed companies or really people to go back and resupply. And your main backup is usually stored under your bed. And in times of emergency, you're eating your backup seed. So what happens is USAID and other well-intentioned organizations fly in with North Carolina and grown rice, which is called Miami rice. What happens then is the, the citizens of Haiti are relying on that free rice, which undercuts the agroeconomic system up north, um, where they still might have rice growing and introduces non-viable seed and pests. So when you have a community seed bank that provides a resource for self-facilitated, um, regenerative, basically being resiliency, seed sovereignty, food security, all those important things. So we worked with this wonderful agronomist to fortify a community seed bank. Um, now, and uh, so now we've gone internationally to a disaster zone and now we go nationally. So there's a program called the Seeds of Success that's run out of the Bureau of Land Management. And in the um, er early 2000, the Millennium Seed Bank, which is a seed bank at Kew Gardens, um, said, you know, 
Svalbard, the global seed vault, is uh, a backup of all of our cultivated crops. But what about all of our wild crops, all of these really fragile native species? This is me scouting for Primula alkylina, this beautiful um, white flower that goes along bubbling brooks in Idaho. And um, no one was safeguarding these wild seeds. And so the Millennium Seed Bank started this program called Seeds of Success, which has this whole litany of protocols, which we actually use for our work at the Ecotype Project, saying that when you're sustainably um, scouting and collecting from wild populations, you have to make sure you have permission and the populations are a certain size and you take herbaria species and so forth. So there's a, a lot that goes into safeguarding our wild species. And um, you can see down below, which is a seed zone map. So you really have to be quite a seed huntress because we would hike miles into remote wildernesses. Um, I think my dad's on the call and I was going in looking for the Draba Hitchcockii, which grows on these rock escarpment outcrops in the greatest rattlesnake territory in the country. And we were duct taping cardboard around our legs. And when my dad heard about that, he kindly sent me out good snake gators to Idaho. But you really start to feel the personality of these different plants, the primula versus the draba and, and the ecosystems that they grow in. And you realize that there are such fragile ecotones from where a, a, an ancient clay vein drips down is where one rare species and then just a couple inches over that species habitat um, it, it, it no longer exists. So you can see how fragile it is protecting these species. So now we finally come back. Let's go regionally. So in the Northeast. And as we are talking about fortifying a pollinator network, now we need to put our bug eyes on. So now we're in the Northeast. Now, as pollinators, do we see where Connecticut ends or where Massachusetts begins? No, we see where the riparian areas are, where the broadleaf forests are, where the coastal areas are and so forth. So a wonderful gentleman named James Obernick at the EPA, he said, all of these people, we need to be working off of a similar framework because the ornithologists were referencing one map and the forestry folks were referencing another one, hydrologists and geologists. And you start to see that even though we might all as scientists be working towards the same goals of conservation and restoration, if we're not working off of a shared framework, it becomes a bit more difficult. So these are eco-region eco-regional maps. And if you just look up EPA eco-regions, this is level three, and they, they have the entire map of the US. You can zoom in more. This is um, actually level four, because you can see um, 59G, 59C. I'll explain what all that means. But basically, um, what we're looking at is a broad stroke kind of artistic mosaic of saying, this, this area, 59, this is the genetics within those habitat and community mosaics. We can know that if we collect the native seed from that area, um, so I'm in ecoregion 59, part of Massachusetts also is as well, that you know if you're proliferating it anywhere along that ecological corridor of 59, you know you're putting the right plants in the right place. So again, um, honoring where I was born and raised. This was the traditional territory of the Pagasset tribe, which means the mouth of the river. Because as we've seen, the Connecticut River, which starts in the Canadian um, border and goes all the way to Long Island Sound, was an extremely imperative causeway, not only for seeds um, being dispersed by all the different auckeries, these very fun words, hydrockery by water, and a mockery by wind, if you think about um, dandelion pappuses and so forth. But this is where all of these seeds and the estuaries of where the fish nurseries were and the chestnut trees, and there was such abundance of life here that it was really just um, a prolific uh, foodways, the traditional foodways of the area. So now we come to the ecotype project. How can we make sure that we are regenerating our living seed banks? So we saw the other versions of seed banks before. Now we move to in situ, I-N space S-I-T-U, which means in place conservation, because ultimately this is the best of the best. This is what we want. These are these seeds 
adapting to the changing climates, to the beneficial insects, to the pests, to all the variations that are going on around them, really bioregionally or now ecoregionally adapting to their terroir. And when you do that, you can see that um, this is your gorgeous um, Joe Pieweed and the Vernonia, the, the New York ironweed here um, at the Hickory's Organic Farm in Ridgefield, Connecticut. Um, these are our founder plots, which I'll explain in a bit, but you can see just how gorgeous these seeds are. And once they're back in our living seed banks, our soils, then the natural ockeries, again, the wind blows it, animockery, myrmockery, the dispersal of seeds by ants, if you haven't looked into myrmecology, the sociological structuring of ants, fascinating. Thank you, Mr. E.O. Wilson. Um, but now, okay, so now let's see, how do we do this? Because um, the fact is, so now you can see this is zoomed out a bit. So I'm talking from the perspective of Eco Region 59, because that's where at CT NOFA, um, we have been focusing um, our work with the farmers here. And we're so glad that there's all the other NOFAs because um, there's such great collaboration and skill sharing, especially as if, if you're hiring that, that pollinator network coordinator, that will be very helpful with this work because we've been trying to aggregate all the folks who do this. The problem with ecotypic seed, um, so ecotypes, are just are saying the wild genetics. So those wild types that we are collecting from the, the landscape, if you're talking about those place-based genetics, that's an ecotype. Now, these are all the different industries that use native ecotypic seed or preferably would want to use native ecotypic seed, whether you're doing restoration, um, habitat creation or mitigation, you know, all of our pollinator work, we really wanna make sure we have the right plants in the right place because let's say, you know, um, the problem is that most of our native pollinator seed is sourced from the Midwest. And that means it's adapted to their climate and might have slightly different bloom times. So if you think about the five-year migration of the monarch, well, if we have plants that are blooming too long, they miss the domino effect of when those milkweeds are blooming all the way down the coast. So even though it looks like maybe we're feeding more pollinators now, we actually might be doing them a disservice because they're missing that ecological succession that goes down their migration path. So that is imperative to why we believe that it's so important to utilize this seed. This is a great study that I have in my resources, which comes out of Mars B, which is the Mid-Atlantic Regional Seed Bank and Ed Toth. Um, I'm sorry to speak so quickly, but there's a lot to cover in 40 minutes. So Ed Toth, he is the one who's been championing safeguarding the ecotypes of the New York City boroughs. And with his work, um, he, they planted over 12 million plants in the New York City parks. And they just, they just conducted this great study. Um, he and Sarah Tangren, who were on the round table we hosted at the Northeast Organic Seed Conference, um, as Peggy mentioned, but they said, people want the seed, but it doesn't exist. I mean, the, they usually only 15% of the time ecotypes are available locally be up for, for these different um, industries. Beyond that, you drive 400 miles and you have to drive 800 miles. So just like we had the conversations around knowing our food shed and our watershed and making sure we're buying local food, now it's time that we know our nursery growers and our botanists and we start buying local native plants. Um, so why as the Northeast Organic Farming Association of Connecticut are we interested in pollinator health? Well, as you can see, um, the blueberries on the left are not well pollinated and the ones on the right are. So as Dina Brewster, our executive director says, um, these, these entomological allies, these are friends who are out in the landscape are actually paying her bills. <laughs> so we need to make sure that we have the habitat and the food that they need so that we can have the food security that we all need. It's a harmonious, um, homeostasis that needs to be well respected because we have the whole conversation of our lawns and there's no habitat and no food for all of them. Now it's our turn to say on our farms, we need to have pollinator habitat. So the Ecotype Project largely functions under a USDA specialty crop block grant where our specialty crop is this ecotypic seed, amplifying this ecotypic seed on organic farms in those founder plots that you saw, those beautiful rows we saw at the hickories. 
So again, just to review how we begin getting this seed sustainably with permission, with botanists who know what they're doing and how to collect it, how we get them from the wilds into cultivation and then to the nursery trade, we work with our botanists, they collect the wild seed, then we propagate that, put them into founder plots, which are 200 plants each on organic farms. Then I and others will come in, collect that seed, clean that seed, stratify it, then give it to our nursery partners and they will grow it out as plugs and then make it available to the gardeners and the landscapers. And eventually if we have enough to the municipalities, because the Department of Transportation here in Connecticut is actually under a pollinator act that says, if and when native seed is available, they have to use it, but it hasn't been available at the scales they need it at. So that's why we're working on bringing more farmers to supply this much in demand, undersupplied need for restoration at the scale that we all know it needs to be happening at. So with that, our pollinators are happy. We're fortifying our ecological corridors. All the great work of the pollinator pathway folks um, is at, are planting the right plants for the right place and giving our living seed banks what they need and so forth. So here's Jordy Elkins, one of our main botanists at Highstead, scouting. This is Spartina. Hopefully we're going to start getting into the halophytes or the salt tolerant species to talk more about coastal restoration. And certainly we work with um, a strategic round table of the native plant working group, different um, colleges and universities. And there are quite a few folks that we've gathered to figure out what species are we bringing into the pipeline? Now, this is predominantly dependent on the funding that we can receive to bring new species into the pipeline. Because as you've seen, it's a long process and takes a lot of people to get the seeds from the wild into the nursery trade. And so, so far, these are the species that we're working with. We started with species that people would recognize, that people that, that are easy to work with, because um, we basically had to prove that there was a market for this. and. Um, we sure have, and these are so beautiful. And if I can tell you, as you'll see later, the ROI of seed, you plant one seed and in two years off of those 200 plants, we're collecting millions. So as I say, in the face of climate change, it's too late to be pessimistic. And uh, you know, just planting one seed can really do a lot. So what do these beautiful plants look like? Here is the Penstemon digitalis, the beard tongue, and you can see it in its different stages throughout the season. Um, this is a great friend of the, the hummingbirds and um, just a gorgeous, gorgeous flower. And I think just a, a remarkable um, seed head as well. They, they kind of rattle and you can see them ripening. Um, so a seed is a fruit. So just like a fruit, a seed has its perfect time of maturity and you have to be monitoring it. And um, as we'll see, I think it's, let's see where that slide is. As we'll see later, um, they don't all ripen at the same time. So like, let's say the Joe pie weed, when you see it get really fluffy and start to blow away, well, you harvest into a brown paper bag, what's fluffy, but then you have to go back to get the rest because if you're harvesting immature seed, that messes with your germination. And well, it's it would be like harvesting a vegetable or a fruit before it's at its perfect ripeness. Um, so again, um, these are the different partners we work with for the founders plots. And um, I think we've gone over all of this as we rewild our landscapes and uh, allow these, you know, we reduce fragmentation with having these on our farms, in our backyards, everywhere, everywhere that we can plant these habitats is important in that concept of rewilding because um, as our wild areas get more separated, we're not just homeowners, but we're land stewards and need to think of our yard as part of that citizen science. So in an effort to make sure that we're taking care of our pollinators throughout the seasons, um, we make sure that we have uh, we were still working on the early spring ephemerals. Like we're th those we don't have as much as we need in our pipeline. We're working on all of them actually to make sure that we can cover the different habitats, high and dry, wet, shady, everything you can think of, but also that they bloom through um, from you know early spring to late fall all throughout the year. Um, I heard this wonderful woman from the South talk and she said, um, 
It's like, y'all, if you invite house guests, house guests over for a week and only feed them on Monday, she said, if you have to make sure that we have food for them throughout the season. And as we've seen, um, and also with the different trophic layers. So that picture in the center, we think about perennial polycultures or the patterns of our natural wild forests. You can see that there's the ground covers and the shrubs and the trees and different pollinators and insects and creatures need those different trophic layers for their habitats. So we wanna make sure we incorporate that in our landscape. And as we've had these founders pots, it is just like a wild safari out there. Now, entomology is not my background, but I am sure learning. And it is just extraordinary to see diversity brings diversity. And if you're having problems on your farm, the more diversity you have, again, works for that homeostasis because it's like lack and larder. You might have a lot of aphids and such, but then you're just missing whatever their predator is. So as we build this in, we see that the landscape is taking care of itself. And so we have different pollinators that visit our plants throughout the season and even throughout the day. So Jean Linville and Abby Cartson, who are the farmers at the hickories for their founder plots, they said, you know, we're not seeing the pollinators on the Rebecca Herta. Like, where are they? We don't get it. So one night they put on their red headlamp and start and went out at night. And lo and behold, there were the moths and all these other pollinators were out at night. And so if you think about it, Holy moly, right? I, you don't have to go to Africa to go on safari. You can go in your backyard. And um, they they then did that, uh, I don't know, maybe tw like once a week for the rest of the season. And they were amazed at what they saw. So um, you can see the wild bergamot down in, in the, that's the Monarda fistulosa, just beautiful species. So again, here is that, um, that Joe pie weed, as I was saying. So you can see it's different. Um, uh, phenology and morphology here. And you can see that uh, it, as it's ripening, so the picture all the way on the bottom, I think you've let your seed, you've let your seed go a little bit too long, but um, up in the top, or sorry, the second to last photo, that's about where you want to harvest it at. So um, that is when I would take my bag and start shaking those seeds off. So in an effort to bring more farmers or just anyone into the ecotype project, well, these aren't exactly quite as easy as planting the annuals that maybe a lot of us are used to. So for farmers or for homeowners, we wanted to make a getting started toolkit. How do we plant these? How do we plant these plants? How do I stratify a seed? Um, what spacing does it need? What beneficial insects like them? All of these different questions we answered in these really cute eight by 11 cards. And we have these black tin boxes, um, like those, like the old school um, seed boxes. And um, we've made all of these cards that I'm gonna show you, which are free PDFs at the bottom of our website, uh, ctnofa.org slash ecotype project, which I'm sure we'll put in the chat. Um, and you can see that what we've done is we have our general growing protocols, our multi-year overview protocols, our general seed saving protocols. And these are a living document because um, we've been talking to all the experts in the area. Certainly you have Native Plant Trust, an amazing resource in Massachusetts and the Sami farms. And we've talked to their propagators and heads of horticulture. And um, hopefully we're building a working group and a collaboration to really create um, uh, a really vital resource for those of us in the Northeast, because in other areas of the country, in the Midwest and out in Oregon, which is like the, the great seed wild west where, um, you know, they've been doing all this type of work and restoration forever. They have to grow um, these types of seeds out on huge scales to do restoration after fires and such. But here in the Northeast, we're missing a bit of the supply chain from, you know, big seed extractories that can clean our seed to storage facilities and so forth. So we're really trying to fortify an ecotypic native seed production network, and hopefully these cards will help. Um, so there's the beautiful ironweed going to seed. Um, just just wonderful to work with these plants. And then you can see that those little grids give you an idea because you often really have to investigate when you're taking chaff away from seed, like, is that the seed or is that the seed? Or I don't know, I need a, you know, you, you really have to look under with a, a magnifying glass sometimes to, to make sure you're gathering the right things in the beginning. And then we have these growers field notes. So we can all be making uh, our own observations and then um, 
come back together and share best practices. Cause it, like anything else in ecology, this is a reciprocal loop. Um, so I won't spend too much time on all of this just for the sake of time. But um, after we grow out these ecotypic seeds, we um, then, as we said, we collect them. So you collect them when they're ripe into brown paper bags. You want to put them somewhere where they can fully desiccate, fully dry out. You don't want any moisture in there. That's what causes mold. Um, and so you let them desiccate and dry out. You can see again, that's the ironweed. Um, then to clean it, those are the papuses that I mentioned, like a dandelion, the things that make them fly in the wind. Um, for home scale, leave them on, re-sow the seed, no problem. For our scale, we need we wipe them off just so that it can be more uniform when we're dispersing the seeds. And then we'll talk about storing, stratifying, which is uh, mimicking what happens out in nature and then germinating again. So as I said before, this is just me showing you on the left where some of those flower buds are not fully ripe seed yet and the ones on the right are. So I'll shake off what does what is ready to go and leave the rest. You also want to make sure you're leaving the stems because a lot of our pollinators like to make their overwinter houses in those stems. So it's important that we leave that for them as well. Um, cleaning can be a bit messy. Certainly my first year in this project before masks were the cool thing. Um, I say that respectfully. <laughs> um, uh, you have to wear a mask because you get a lot of dust and you're rubbing and it's like, it's a mess. So with our grant, that beautiful machine on the right is the Winnow Wizard. So a wonderful lettuce breeder, Frank Morton, who has uh, wild garden seed. If you ever want the coolest lettuces you've ever heard of, Frank Morton's your guy. There was a gentleman there um, who was sick of cleaning lettuce seed, which is a bit tough, uh, on these old clipper machines. So although this machine looks very DIY, it's actually pretty state of the art in terms of winnowing and seed cleaning. There's a hopper that drops the seed. There's, you can move those um, different barricades to the weight of the seed. So chaff goes in one and your good seed falls in another. Um, I'm just learning to really work with it, but you're able to modulate the, the speed of the wind. And hopefully this will help with the pollinator network that you're creating. And certainly amongst the NOFAs, having a shared resource um, that can be used to clean seed and make this more readily available at, uh, a, lar at a larger scale. Um, there is uh, Heron Breen, who's in Westport, Mass. He also has one of these machines. He has um, the Freed, he run, helps run the Freed Seed um, Initiative. So here we are. Here are our ecotypic organic Eco region 59 seed. So maybe we just, you know, we like take a breath of gratitude and appreciation because if you think about it, these seeds represent all the ancestors that have come before us and for all of those that shall come after us and all of our entomological partners and the botanists and the farmers. And so much goes into this that you really stop and have reverence for this seed. You know, my, my great mentor, Bill McDormand from the Rocky Mountain Seed Alliance, he holds up his, his, his cell phone and a seed and he says, which one of these has greater technology? And he say, the seed, because these seeds are able to adapt to so many different climates. And when we're preserving the vast biodiversity that is found in our wild genetics, then we're able to make sure that they can adapt to where we put them. The problem, um, and I don't see the slide in here, but oftentimes in with native plants, we hear about native R's. What's a native R? Oftentimes with this work of rewilding, we're also rewording because it seems like we have to make our own dictionary to define all the terms that we're talking about. But when you think about cultivars or native plant cultivars called native R's, what are those? Well, those are selected for uniformity, showiness, and so forth. And oftentimes in the nursery trade, they're propagated by cuttings, which is per, which is just reproliferating those same genetics over and over and over and over again. And that it was the same problem that we had with the taro that I studied in the South Pacific. When that um, blight washed through onto the island of Samoa in 1993, within three weeks, 
all of their taro was lost. Why? Because it's vegetatively propagated. So even though it was expressing, you know, different visual variations of some with reddish stems or yellow stems, the actual genetics were all the same. So in effect, it was a monoculture. It's the same thing that happened with the Irish potato famine. So the only way to safeguard our wild landscapes and our cultivated food crops is by making sure we have the greatest arcs of diversity possible on our landscapes, because that allows us to have the most adaptability to whichever way the climate shift, cool, dry, warmer, nature knows. And they've built in wisdom beyond any of us can comprehend into the variation that goes into these seeds. So it's, it's very important that we help to proliferate throughout the landscape. So the, the, the adage to remember with seed saving is um, when you're storing it is always cool, dark, and dry. So we want to make sure we keep our seeds cool, dark, and dry. And on the home scale, don't worry about how cool you just want it to be somewhere where the sun's not hitting it and the temperature isn't fluctuating. So just place it as constant temperature because the seeds start to get confused. Like, am I supposed to wake up now? Because remember they're hibernating magic little embryos. So we have to make sure that, um, that we keep them at that constant. So they know like, oh, still time to be in the ton state, still time to be sleeping. Um, but then if we want our native seed to germinate, well, what happens to our native seed on the landscape? As we are all coming into spring now, we know that when the seeds fall to the ground, we get the snow and the freeze and the rain and the thaw and the frost and the, all of these things. And so these seeds are um, adapted to have that type of a situation, climactic situation, um, cause their germination. So that's called stratification. When our uh, the cold, moist stratification is when we're mimicking that that cold period that a lot of these native seeds need to go through to be able to germinate. Now, again, those cards will help you because some like the Monarda don't necessarily, that which is the bergamot, don't necessarily need cold moist stratification, but would benefit from it. So again, there is a bit of nuance working with these species, but basically what you're doing is you're taking your seeds, you're taking a moist, not wet, um, coffee filter works even better than a paper towel because sometimes the seeds stick to the paper towel. You're putting it in a Ziploc and you're labeling what it is and the date that you put it in. And oftentimes they require a 60 or 90 day stratification. So now we're getting on the farther end of when we'd be able to plant them or get them going for spring planting, but fall is actually your best, one of your best bets for planting native plants. Um, and also as Heather McCargo, uh, who is an extraordinary resource. She has the Wild Seed Project up in Maine, and she's been doing this ecotypic work um, with a little bit of a different focus, just making sure that these habitats are proliferated everywhere, whereas we're the farm amplification focus. But she has um, an, a, a yearly publication from the Wild Seed Project, which is the most gorgeous you could cry, like I did when I first saw the ecoregion map, um, publication that, that shows you how to do all these things that maybe me speaking at a million miles an hour seem complicated, but really they're kind of intuitive. So this is how you winter sow seeds. And um, basically you just put them out somewhere in nature and let nature do its trick. The only thing you have to do is cover it so make sure rodents don't eat it. But you can put it out in a pot right after you harvest it, put something over it and just let it be. And when they're ready, they'll start germinating. So um, certainly check out the Wild Seed Project and they now have this new pledge to rewild. And uh, once you sign up, you get some really cool newsletters and tips how you can do that in your own backyard. Um, so again, we want to make sure that these plants are getting to our end users, to the pollinator pathways, to the land trusts, to the homeowners, municipalities, conservation organizations, restoration, as was shown in that bar graph of who wants the seed. It's really limitless. So for any of you farmers out there who are in Eco Region 59 and want to start a founder plot, please reach out to me because I have seed for you. And we would love to have you start growing these ecotypes. Um, there are plant sales uh, right now. They are the ones that I know of are um, based down in Connecticut. So the Aspatuck Land Trust has a great uh, plant sale. And um, I, I, I think most of you are in Massachusetts. So I'll, I'll save you from that. But I know um, the people, the, the, the folks facilitating this um, may have some suggestions of more local plant sales where, where these are available. But really 
what our effort is with promoting our logo. We're not trying to recreate the wheel. We're trying to bring everyone together. So we're trying to say, um, it takes that huge ecology. Uh, everyone's welcome at this table. The farmers, the scientists, the botanists, we all have a role to play, the homeowners. Um, and we want this brand to be this socially conscious brand so that when you go to your nurseries, you can start asking for native ecotypes. And this can be recognizable to know that when these are implemented on your landscape, that you really know the provenance of, of your native plants and species. And this isn't to vilify anyone who has beautiful pollinator gardens that you got from somewhere else. That's great. We need all we can get. But now, just as we're elevating the conversation, this is kind of the next, the next phase that we move into saying um, there's been a lot of research and study that that these really are our greatest allies in doing this ecological restoration work. Um, in an effort, again, as the seed huntress to help bring some fun and brevity to all of this great work, uh, I started the inaugural botanical expedition last September. So I say I'm not a botanist, I'm a boatnist. And um, I am honored to be a flag carrier for Wings World Quest, which is an amazing organization that supports women in science. And um, just, and I'm also a member of the Explorers Club, which is the, you know, the hallowed halls of where Ernest Shackleton would come present to. But for me, I kind of do the, the fan off thing when I think about going on expedition, that's, that's really what I love to do. And certainly being on the water with native plants is like the best of all worlds. So what I did is nine fellow um, botanical expeditioners and I, we took five canoes 500 native plants and paddled 87 miles down the Connecticut River. You can see the traditional spelling of Connecticut, which again means the Long Tidal River. And what we did is uh, we started at the John Ledyard Canoe Club, which is at Dartmouth, which, well, that's a whole other story, but he was of the first class, made a dugout canoe, paddled to his uncle's, hitchhiked on a steamship, went on James Cook's expedition, died crossing the Siberian taiga. Interesting, great cool, very cool story. So we honored him and paddled 87 miles. And it wasn't until we got past the Bellows Falls Portage, mile and a half of five boats and 500 native plants, that we were in Eco Region 59. So in an effort to promote putting the right plants in the right place, we didn't start planting our pollinator gardens until we were actually in Eco Region 59. So as we paddled for the pollinators, we worked with some remote campsites and also a beautiful farm. Um, once we were in Vermont, of planting these back in our living sea banks. Because again, once they're there, the ockeries, animocery, um, dispersal by wind, hydrochery, dispersal by water, and anthropochery, dispersal by humans. So we need to work with nature, not against it. We're a part of it. And we have such an amazing role to play as caretakers and stewards in our own backyards. And um, once the seeds are there, nature does its thing. Nature does its thing, and I, I can't tell you that the powerful moment when we put the plants in, and we, I looked up, and there were these two bald eagles soaring overhead. Is, and and for me, I took that as a way of like, um, just giving gratitude to the fact that we can do this work and help support the regeneration of this land, because you know oftentimes it's just talked about the anthrop anthropocentric destruction, but we really have a huge ability to regenerate and restore. And um, with that said, well, um, here's just a, here's just a brief video of what that beautiful river looks like. And uh, I just encourage all of you there, there's, you know, here in the Northeast, there's such beauty and such magnificent wilderness around us. And if we can all just carry some seeds with us where we go, we can, really help do some amazing work. Again, just 200 plants create millions. So there's one of the pollinator gardens on the left with some of our fellow expeditioners. And um, my dad got me a really awesome paddle. It says the seed huntress he met partway on the river. That was pretty much the greatest present ever. Thanks dad. And uh, my mom at the end also had a paddle for me too. Um, but the next botanical expedition 2.0, we're going from where we ended at the Massachusetts border, hint, hint, 
to anyone who wants to join on to the Long Island Sound. And I'm working on getting us gig boats. So gig boats are those like six person rowboats that they used to use in the 1700s to bring captains back out to their ships. Because I love the agrarian history meets the riparian and nautical history. And we just want to revive all of these great things and how transport used to be done by boats. So the tentative dates for that are the autumnal equinox, September 17th to the 22nd. And um, again, we're all, we all have a role to play. And I will end before I can take questions and I can certainly stay as long as anyone would like. But again, my mentor, Bill McDormand, he says, we are the people of the pinch at a pinch in time in our genetic biodiversity when we can either stand by and watch this massive erosion of the magnificence of the symphony of ecology that's all around us or stand in as stewards and help caretake these seeds and proliferate them for all generations to come. So a credo the seed huntress lives by is we save seeds because seeds save. And um, I thank you all for listening to this. Uh, I know fast paced um, global a dive into restoration. Here's some resources. And here again is our website. Thank you. And you can see that beautiful chrysalis at the bottom where, where we have one of our pollinator plantings. You say, this, this actually works. And um, with that, I will stop sharing my screen and see if we have any questions. Um, I just want to say a huge thank you she brought a lot of facts, but if you didn't notice how much passion she has, <laughs> Sephra is, you're one of the most passionate speakers I've heard. And uh, when we heard you in, in NOFA, um, New York, you had other speakers, but now I got, a, I got a full dose of that passion. And I like the phrase, we can do this work, but it's, it has to be very collaborative. And, and that's just the reason why we're making this Massachusetts network. We've been Western Mass, we're great having fun here, but it really needs to be across boundaries, <laughs> not only Massachusetts, but I took a lot of notes on how we can collaborate with your project. We have a seed shortage. We have Dr. Rob Jagir's list of plants that are preferred by at-risk bees. And I hope everyone is just inspired to Put a little money in the kitty to help us get this Massachusetts network off the ground and uh, you have been a model of the type of event that we want to keep keep uh, offering to to everybody in the network so thank you again and Marty take it away you you have some questions in the uh, chat there's a few there so I'd love to yeah. hear it well, I just want to, uh, I want to say, I, wa I wanted to play an audience, uh, you know, a sample of everyone clapping uh, as you were ending <laughs> there, because that, that wasn't just a, a download of incredible information. It was absolutely inspiring. Uh, it was a, mo a motivational speech, to, to say the least. I know that I feel motivated to, uh, to get involved, uh, however possible. And yeah, and count me in for the, for the paddle as well. Um, before, you, before you start the questions, I just want to mention uh, Marty's going to be sending out the link to both Sephra's um, recording um, and also a, a shorter version that you can send to your friends that might be interested who maybe haven't given a donation yet. We're inspiring people to donate in order to get the recordings. And believe it or not, there have been quite a few donations um, to do that. So. Uh, we'll have something for you to send to your friends, and then you, of course, can have access to um, the recording if you've been a donor. So, okay, Marty. Great. Thanks, everyone. And if you didn't see it, I, I did paste in the chat again uh, the link to our Rally Up page. Um, but yeah, thank you, everyone, for the questions throughout. We have a few good ones here. Uh, first one that I, I know I was thinking as soon as I looked at that map, and um, we need to geek out about bioregional maps at some point in the future. Um, yeah. But uh, what do we do if we're right across the line uh, in Ecoregion 58? Um, and I know that I'm in Col uh, present day Coleraine and uh, right, at, right along the green, the Pacamagon River, and I'm right over that edge. And I know that uh, I think it was Rebecca also asked there about two miles uh, into 58. Is there another project like this in 58? Can we, since we're on the border, be a founder for, you know, how, how does that work? How can we, uh, how, how can us outliers uh, get plugged in? 
It's a great question. And that's honestly what our project is looking to find all, all of the folks and the seed keepers that have that for each of the different eco regions. So hopefully this will be a model at 59 that can be re replicated throughout these. The best resource is I know for 58, I, I believe um, that the Native Plant Trust, um, which is in Massachusetts, would have 58 ecotypes. And I, but there, that's not Reddit. I think they just do a plant sale to the public once or twice a year. Maybe you all know better than I do. In terms of the seed that we have, we'll, who we're giving our founder plot seed to, we wanna make sure that that stays within Eco Region 59 just for amplification purposes, but we don't want to deter anyone who's excited about doing this work. Again, we don't want, you know, perfect to the be en to be the enemy of good. If, if you're just putting in a restoration habitat or a pollinator habitat on at your home, I would say that those genetics would work great if you're if you're right there on that border. But in terms of founder plots, that's really why we're reaching out to Native Plant Trust and other people to see. We want to make sure that we're really help proliferating those different ecotypes where they are. So perhaps um, when you're all forming a network and there's, and I know that you're hiring for that position, uh, a great project would be for them to help source ecotypic 58 seed. And then I could help liaise in terms of how we then take it from that to founder plots to the nurseries and so forth. Love it. Oh, that's great. Well, uh, we'll definitely keep that on, uh, on uh, keep a note for our uh, new hire. Hopefully we'll have some candidates rolling in uh, starting tonight. We just posted the job posting for the uh, Mass Pollinator Network Coordinator posted in here. Uh, it is on the website nofamass.org slash jobs. I'll paste it in the chat as well. Uh, let me see what other, other questions we have here. Um, yeah, do, does the project teach uh, partner growers how to clean seeds and 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 are there like what does the educational programming look like if someone wants to get on? Are there are there regular workshops? Is there uh, are there toolkits? What is the for, for those who might be um, you know apprehensive of, of diving in? What does that process look like? Great question. Um, so that beautiful winter wizard that you showed, uh, obviously with this pandemic that we find ourselves in, um, we will have times when the winter wizard is open to the farmers to be able to kind of rent it out and utilize it. It's definitely meant to be a shared resource. We also will, um, we have a bunch of, you know, educational workshops. So if you, uh, hopefully we'll be able to do one explaining the winter wizard and some scene cleaning over Zoom as part of the Ecotype Project's educational outreach that we're doing um, it later in the fall when it's seed cleaning time again. But uh, certainly it is our intention to open that up and have a few seed cleaning and demo days. You know, usually at the summer conference, for example, right, where all the NOFAs would be joined together, we would bring it there. And then so everyone could use it or clean their seed or do things like that. So that, uh, that definitely is a great resource. In terms of seed cleaning, you really can do quite a bit with just even from the dollar store, every size sieve you can find. And you can kind of just play around with it until you're sifting through and you're getting some clean seed or um, practicing just basic winnow techniques. If you're just working with a small lot of seeds, there's there's some great resources even on the internet that you can search and do that from. For our purposes, when that first year you saw the picture of me trying to clean the Joe Pye weed and there's dust everywhere. For this year, we partnered with the folks at the Mid-Atlantic Regional Seed Bank who have industrial size seed cleaning equipment. So what, what took me two months last year took 20 minutes. <laughs> so um, as, as you know, they have these machines that brush off all the papuses where I'm like rubbing by hand in my mom's living room. Um, so yeah, so seed cleaning is really fun and we do hope to definitely have some, some workshops to help teach that a bit more. Fantastic. And uh, we did have a request for the list of references uh, that were the, uh, at the end. Uh, we'll certainly be able to uh, sh send that out in the uh, email. If, Seth, if you want to email that to me or, and or Peggy, we can uh, be sure to include that. We had a request for that. And uh, we sure. have a question. I can see if I can copy and paste it real quick. Oh, sorry. Great. Um, we also had a question just uh, practically about, like, what do you do about deer browse damage and other, other is it just a matter of planting enough to share, I, I imagine, or, or how, how do we... 
um, deal um, with that aspect? So at the hickories, those founder plots are in a fenced in area. And um, other farms that we work with, um, there, there's some of these plants, like we found that, you know, the yarrow, for example, seemed to do just fine in an open area that, that didn't get browsed too badly. Certainly some of them are more attractive than others. But um, if you have a, fen a, a ability to fence off just during the establishment phase, that, that'll help out a lot. But, um, but it definitely is one, one of the fun challenges. And I'm seeing, hopefully this will come through. Let me see if I paste that. If Okay, so those are the resources that I had at the end of the slide. Great. So that's a link to where you can find the eco-regional maps, that great study that I referenced that had those bar graphs on it. Um, some really interesting reading on native seeds and ecological restoration. Um, and my email. Um, and for any of you who want to come paddle, as soon as we actually just stay in touch, we'll, we'll post it on the Ecotype Project website. But as soon as we know where we're going to be, when, if you just want to join us for the day or whenever we're coming through your part of Massachusetts, please hop on the river. Um, and we'd love to have the, the botanical expedition support this network any way it can and help have that shared conversation. And hopefully, get some marketing and some fun around this so people understand the importance of proliferating these pollinator gardens along riparian corridors all over. Fantastic. Well, it does, that does sound like fun and I already have it in my calendar. Um, <laughs> I, I hope, I hope uh, others will uh, check that out as well. And um, we, we have the websites here. Um, yeah, there's just, there's so much to connect on. I'm really, really grateful to you, Sephra, for, for bringing this project Um uh, to the world and to us. Uh, and uh, really, it seems like there's a lot of great synergy with um, what we're trying to do with the Massachusetts Pollinator Network and with the Ecotype Project that uh, be certain to uh, turn, whoever takes over as the network coordinator, uh, we will uh, be sure they watch this video if, if they're not already here watching it already. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm glad we have this recorded. Uh, I know I'll be watching it again. And like Peggy said, we'll also be sharing like a 15 or 20 minute uh, preview uh, that folks can share with their Facebook groups, friends, anything to let them know this is what we're trying to do with the Mass Pollinator Network. We need to raise this money in order to hire the coordinator so we can have ongoing educational programming, mentorship, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, and the ability to scale out efforts statewide to uh, protect pollinators and build up these habitats. So if you haven't gotten a chance to donate yet, uh, you can do that on the link I'll paste in again uh, on our Rally Up page, or you can visit Mass Pollinator Network, uh, org. Um, this is the, the last in the March speaker series, but we will certainly be uh, putting more together uh, as the network launches. Just want to thank everyone again uh, for coming out this evening and thank you everyone for uh, everyone who's watching this uh, at a later date. Um, I look forward to connecting with you all and I'll pass back to Peggy if you had any, any, anything. Can else I to... just, can I just add one more thing, Marty, real quick? Um, I just want to echo what you said this work is certainly my passion, but it really does take money to make it happen. Um, that's not just a shameless plea for this, but but this is literally the most important work I believe that we can all be doing. And um, from sourcing the seed to supporting the installation, uh, there is cost associated with all of this. And so I think it's really great that you all are raising money from your network because I know Every dime of that, I'm sure, will go to its highest good in, in helping to achieve these objectives on a Northeastern scale. So uh, I wish you all the best of luck and I'll certainly spread the word from my end. And uh, to all of you out there in the Zoom apocalypse here, thank you for taking the time to listen to this. And we hope you stay involved with the Ecotype Project too and hope to see on the river. <laughs> <laughs>